Even if we have some equipment and blah, 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 after a while you dive because of the cold, which is not a bad way to dive because you, 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 you fall in sleep and uh, it's not, uh, you don't suffer <laughs> in this case. <laughs> we know that, but we never think that could happen, you know, it's, it never come to our head. I got nightmares in my head, I fear thoughts build up until I can't My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear The thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. On September 11, the question that's been hanging in the ether ever since the Titan tragedy in June boomeranged back into focus. The New York Times described P.H. Nardule's presence on the Titan as a riddle that still haunts us. Victor Vescovo, Stockton Russia's more celebrated and successful counterpart in deep sea exploration, described it as a great source of puzzlement. Meanwhile, Dr. Alfred McLaren, President Emeritus of the Explorers Club, was more frank in his incredulity. He said he wanted to ask Nardula at the time, what the hell are you doing? Meaning, why are you associating yourself with this dodgy experimental craft? It is a pickle, no doubt about it. The challenge now is to put ourselves in P.H. Nardjolet's shoes. Do you think you can do that? Can you put yourself aside and intuit the whims and the will of another person? How deeply can you do that? Can you find your way into the authentic symbolic constructs of someone else? Because that is the work of identity, one of the crucial tools in the TCRS toolbox. And it's a tool we'll be talking about in more depth quite soon. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Bear in mind, I haven't forgotten the matchup between Stockton Rush and James Cameron. I'm still working on that, so look out for that. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. Let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. According to the New York Times, since the June 18 disaster, no single answer to that question of why was P.H. Nardjale on board the Titan? You know, why was he not, uh, why was he so comfortable on this strange apparatus? And so one theory holds that Mr. Nardjale believed that his undersea skills would let him manage Titan's obvious design flaws. That, exp- that explanation is also one that P.H. himself gave to Patrick Leahy, the CEO of Triton Submarines. Another explanation, another theory, is that his love for the storied 1912 shipwreck, this is again quoting from the New York Times, uh, you know, he was known as Mr. Titanic after all, blinded him to the dangers. And I do think there is an element of blindness to this, It's similar to summit fever in the high mountains, and to argue that one is blind to risk almost misses the point of the adventure in the first place. Someone actually left a comment saying, do adventurers lack imagination? It's quite an interesting question. Anyway, after presenting these first two lower hanging options from Nardjale's fruit tree, the New York Times digs a little deeper, and it's really quite interesting Uh, this third theory that they come up with. According to the article, quote, but Mr. Nardjale may have had other motivations as well. For decades, the submariner was locked in a feud with Robert D. Ballard, an American oceanographer often credited with the wreck's 1985 discovery. The two men represented different sides of a broader dispute involving governments in opposition across the ocean the Atlantic Ocean, as well as competing philosophies on shipwrecks, a fray that Washington rejoined in recent days. Both sought the moral high ground. Their conflict centered on whether the ship's artifacts should be retrieved. Now, again, 
we want to put ourselves in the shoes of Najule. And I think in order to do that, one's got to make it quite personal. And one way to do that is to ask the question, how do you feel if you were in charge or if you had any say, if you had any influence, how would you feel about Titanic's artifacts? And really centers around the question, should they be left where they are or should they be retrieved and exhibited and auctioned and should people be able to make money out of retrieving and selling them? Now, going back to the article, this difference of opinion never left Mr. Najanele's mind, even into the early hours before his final dive. Dr. Ballard, an oceanographer, is often credited with discovering the Titanic. He has made this claim himself in the subtitle of his memoir, and when he told a federal judge in Virginia in 2017, I'm the person who discovered the, the, the Titanic. I think what's quite interesting is that reference that Ballard was in a courtroom talking to a judge and giving his credentials. And that was in 2017. It's interesting that the New York Times doesn't really elaborate on that when they know that he was in that situation, in that setting. Anyway... He also said that Jean-Louis Michel, leader of the French team in the 1985 expedition, never gets enough credit as the shipwreck's co-discoverer. Now, that is something I've also been wanting to share with you guys, is the story, which is also quite intriguing, of Titanic's discovery. Why it took so long to find the Titanic, how they discovered it, and also the sort of I'm not sure if one wants to call it a false flag operation, but the the scheme under which the false pretenses under which the search for the Titanic was actually ultimately conducted. Really interesting story. If you'd like me to go into it, let me know in the comments. Anyway, going back to the article, Dr. Ballard was a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution on Cape Cod when the Titanic was found. He started out on the same side as Mr. Nargile. You kind of have these two individuals who become famous on the basis, on the back in a way, the broken back of the Titanic. It's, t the Titanic becomes their claim to fame. But then, although it starts out, they start out on the same side, they end up becoming rivals and, in a way, enemies that have a difference of, of opinion and are at cross purposes to one another. In October 1985, um, Ballard told Congress that he supported recovering those delicate items lying outside the hull. And I think that was in order to motivate the efforts to try and find the Titanic. You know, just that went before Congress. And at the time, he thought that that was a worthy thing to do. He's since changed in his mind. Now, according to the article, these objects would be shoes, leather bags, other small items. A lot of the big items have already been recovered. And then as the, this is going back to the article, as the French and Mr. Nargile recovered such artifacts, uh, as well as parts from inside the ship, Ballard reversed himself. He became a public voice of preservation, and bear in mind, he's now presenting himself as the person who found the Titanic. He's becoming a, a, a very prominent authority, and so he starts arguing that the Titanic, like the remains of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor, should be honored and respected as a great tragedy and left untouched. And now, this is where I want to ask you, how do you feel about that? Do you think it should be left untouched? Look, like go down and look, but don't touch? Or do you think it should be preserved, um, parts brought back to the surface, archived, documented, whatever? And so it was Ballard who cast the ship's salvers, the, those salvaging these um, items, as grave robbers. And so, according to the article, his voice carried far. Starting in 1987, he published a half dozen books with Titanic in the title and hosted a similar number of television shows. And then this, this led to a lot of opprobrium and hurt feelings on the side of the French. 
including P.H. Nardjale, they deeply resented, according to the article, being called grave robbers, and they came to see the this American expert as stealing credit for the ship's discovery. And I don't think it's just sour grapes. There is some truth in or some some valid aspect to the resentment for Ballard um, in their in their to to their minds stealing credit for the ship's discovery. And this was actually expressed in P. H. Nardjale's book, which came out during COVID in 2022. His book was published in French in 2022. And so what comes out as a result of this article and as a result of this theory, you know, dealing with the rivalry and perhaps resentment with with this rival, with this competitor, is quite a strong emotional narrative that that this man felt hurt, felt betrayed, felt um, maligned, I guess, in certain ways, and possibly also just frustrated. He may have felt that it was unfair that this other person was perhaps stealing his fire. And so, according to the article, Dr. McLaren said that Nargile felt a very strong sense of betrayal. And so what is he doing with those feelings? Is he overcompensating? Is he thinking rationally? And so Dr. McLaren goes on to say that he spoke about this repeatedly and that it never left his mind. And that must tell you that it weighed on his heart and perhaps in a way clouded his thinking. You know, if you say that he was blinded by love for the Titanic or, or passion for what he was doing. I suppose one could also say that he was confused or what I suppose one could say blinded as well by other emotions, uh, other negative emotions that had to deal with the dark side of that love affair. Going back to the article, Mr. Nargela and Dr. Ballard began to battle openly after the American in late 2004 condemned the Selvers in a National Geographic article. Um, there was a caption titled Grave Site or Gold Mine in reference to the Titanic. And I, I've seen some people on this channel making similar comments. And to be honest, I'm one of them. You know, I don't really know whether the Titanic for me is such a spectacular thing that I would want to go down and see, you know, go down into the gloom and, and see you know, basically a graveyard for 1,500 people. Um, is that something that is really so terribly exciting? And I, But I do understand that it is exciting for some people. I just don't really think it's exciting for me. The other side to that is, um, what, what, what about turning that into kind of a money-making racket, this basically grave site? And that is where I think it deals with your personal um, ethics and your personal standards, I guess, and your personal approach to this whole thing. Because now you're turning that into a money-making thing in the same way that Stockton Rush is trying to turn trips to the... The, the Titanic into kind of a, a bus drive, a, a bus is trying to turn submersibles into a kind of a taxi. And so Ballard actually accused divers of damaging the the ship, calling them bulls in the china shop. And Nargile uh, resented this, saying that, you know, they didn't do any damage. And he then wrote an open letter charging Ballard with conflating natural decay of the wreck with human damage, saying, you know, obviously this wreck is changing. It's kind of dissolving. Um, it's, it's turning into dust because of the natural action of the, of the um, bacteria that sort of turns the metal into rust. And so there were some insulting messages, insulting statements in this open letter that he wrote where he said he called Dr. Ballard, quote, unfamiliar with shipwrecks in general. It's quite a statement to make to someone who's, quote, unquote, discovered the Titanic. And that was then another area that Nargile wanted to deal with. Did he really discover the Titanic? And so in 2022, 
Quoting from the article, Mr. Nogelet's book, which was published in France, recounted not only his decades of Titanic dives, but then also the description of the wreck's discovery in terms of the history around it. And so Nogelet highlights the awkward moment for Dr. Ballard um, in terms of how he learned about it, how Nogelet learned about how that took place. And he says, it happened late at night. In the control room, Mr. Michel, obviously a French um, component to the crew, he was the leader of the French team and the co-leader of the, ex the expedition. He was monitoring a tethered robot, according to the article, when suddenly there it was. Images of wrecked debris appeared on the video screen and it was the Titanic. It was this ship that they'd been searching for for such a long time. Well, where was Dr. Ballard when this happened? Well, I don't know whether he was sleeping, but he was certainly off duty. He wasn't in that control room. He was in his cabin. And in order to locate him, to, to let him know, wow, we found the ship, the, the team sent the, the ship's cook uh, on a little errand to do that. And so in his book, Nargelet wrote, the anticlimax does not prevent Bob Ballard from proclaiming himself the sole discoverer of the wreck. And so, as you can see, there is some, if that story is true, there is some, um, I think, valid feeling from the French that uh, maybe, maybe on the one hand he's overstated things, maybe on the other hand they do deserve a little more credit than they've had. But I do, th what my personal opinion of all of this is that I think competition and competitive rivalry was a big part of what was driving Nargela. You know, he wasn't just there on the Titan. He had all of this history behind him, all of this um, sort of um, comparison to this other dude that was stealing his thunder. And I think he was trying to emerge as, as the undisputed hero of the story, right? And so you kind of get the idea that there was still a race, still a contest going on regarding who was the actual number one expert on the Titanic, who was the definitive voice on all things Titanic. And he wanted to remain relevant. And I think him writing that book, when Bob Ballard had written quite a few books as well, was Nargelet's attempt to try and turn the tables, to try and find his right, what he thought perhaps was his rightful place in the history books, I guess. According to the New York Times, uh, in all, Mr. Nargelet made 38 dives to the shipwreck. I'm not sure if that information is accurate. I'm not sure if it's 37 dives and then he, di he died on the, the 38th dive. Um, in any event, I w and so if, he, if that's true, I don't know if you can count the 38th dive as a dive. I think if you come back from it, then that counts as a dive. Anyway, he eventually went to work for RMS Titanic Inc. Um, the company based near Atlanta had obtained from a federal court in Norfolk, Virginia, the exclusive salvage rights to the ship's artifacts. Mr. Nogelet became the company's director of underwater research. Now, what I don't think is really uh, emphasized enough in that article is that RMS Titanic a lot of what they were all about was auctioning off these artifacts. And so one can also see how Nargelet's uh, wealth, his prestige, his income would be tied to his work. And then also the frustration, the inability to sell that sort of thing. And, um, you know, if he was attached to RMS Titanic and to auctioning off artifacts, then perhaps going down into the Titanic, you know, in 2023, perhaps that was also a way to promote his books, to promote himself, and to promote this, the, the interest in selling these artifacts, which potentially were worth quite a lot of money. Does that make sense? And so, anyway, going back to the article, Nargelet saw the shipwreck as a kind of archaeological site whose treasures could become the showpieces of museums and exhibitions. He cast the displays as important not only for public education, 
but also for commemorating the more than 1,500 people who lost their lives. That may be true, but he was also perhaps one of the foremost people involved in trying to, from, from the way I understand it, trying to sell, trying to auction these artifacts, and that was not the position that Ballard took. And so there was difficulty. As far as I know, some of these artifacts were auctions or, or auctioned, or at least they tried to auction them for millions, not always successfully. The New York Times neglects to mention an exhibition company, Premier Exhibitions, of which RMS Titanic Inc. was a subsidiary, was embroiled in lawsuits and bankruptcy since July 2017. And so they do mention that Najula would sometimes tour with the artifacts. In 2017, he traveled to Peoria, Illinois, to speak at a traveling exhibition. Now, I don't know what or if a financial narrative plays any role in Najula's calculus. Information on that score has been hard to come by. In fact, when you Google his net worth, you know, there are stories from strange sources saying that He's a billionaire. I really don't think that that's the case. Um, I, I uh, seem to. It seems to me more likely that there's some kind of financial difficulty going on in the background. In any event, uh, information on that score has been difficult to to come by. I wouldn't be surprised if it p- did play a role. I can't see how a 15-year legal battle over millions of dollars worth of unsold Titanic artifacts. I can't see how that could have helped. Nargile's fortunes. But I also think that this was about good old ego and vanity. You know, I think you can get lost in the details. Um, I think it's also about those basic things. You know, as part of Ocean Gate, Nargile had his bum in the butter. He could bask in his own celebrity. You know, on board these ships, he would give presentations. His job was to share his expertise, to show off his best in field knowledge to astronauts, to billionaires, to other adventurers. It was a way for a 77 year old man to feel useful and important in real time, not just in the rearview mirror. I think the biggest aspect fueling Nargile was a, a sense of romantic nostalgia, and you kind of get a sense of that at the clip at the beginning of this where you kind of get a sense of how he views life in a in a kind of a sunny, he's got a sort of a sunny view of things. Each su- successive dive to the Titanic reinforced and validated all of his earlier work and connected him to an earlier life as well. And I think some of the romance around Titanic is this, and I don't just mean with Nargile in general, is this idea of pining for another time when people lived large and expressed their style in old-fashioned romantic sorts of ways. In the same way that Nargile seemed in denial about the Titan's flaws, his daughter seems to be in denial, understandably though, about her father's fate, four days after the doomed craft had fallen silent. On June 22nd, she was interviewed and I think a very good way of getting into his shoes, psych, uh, into his, his psychology, is looking at how his daughter thought about his fate at that time and you know her approach to that based on the information that was known. She said, sometimes I don't check the news because I don't want to hear them saying that they now have very low oxygen. You can kind of imagine that he had the same attitude to the flaws on the titan you know sometimes i just don't check i don't really necessarily want to hear about that she said i prefer to listen to positive things to hope that they will continue looking for them and you can imagine in the same sense that he would look at stockton and prefer to focus on the positive things that stockton rush was saying right and so if his daughter sedoni is a chip of the old block then I wonder if PH wasn't in denial about Titan as well. Although his presence validated the Ocean Gate operation, that wasn't Nar- what Nargile was there to do. You know, he, he, that wasn't his expertise. He's not there as an engineer. And so because he was blinded or if his view was softened by a warm and fuzzy approach, he may have simply hoped for the best and tried to be positive and optimistic, which is sometimes what adventurers are known for. It's sometimes, in a way, a strength 
in these kinds of situations, except, as James Cameron has said, in a situation like this, there ought to be no question whatsoever around the safety of the craft. And obviously, there was. Who knows, perhaps Stockton's spin settled things in Argelais' mind, as it did in many others, and his own ambition and perhaps vanity did the rest. I know it may sound harsh and critical to use that word, vanity, but I wonder what Nargile thought privately of himself. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that off, what are you? Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. In a way, Titanic was Nargile's suit of armor, wasn't it? Take that off, and how did he think of himself? And so going back to what Sidoni Nargile's daughter said, at the time when he was missing, she said, if they are not found, it'll be very sad for us because we will not see him again. What he liked the most was to be in a submarine near the Titanic. He is where he really loved being. I would prefer him dying at a place where he's very happy, Nargile said, struggling to hold back her tears. So whether he's in a submarine and whether he's in the Titanic, I know he likes it. I hope there will be a good outcome, that they will find him. In any case, he is happy where he is. That's reassuring. I don't mean to sound mean, but I think this wishful thinking from his daughter, which is quite human, which is quite understandable, but not necessarily logical or accurate, sums up Nargelet's approach to what he was doing. He hoped there would be a good outcome. This is in terms of the design of the Titan, even though evidence was piling up that there wouldn't be. In that situation, we allow ourselves to be misled by fairy tales in spite of the facts, and the real world just doesn't work this way. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.